Well, I've been around a lot of worship, guys, and that's, that's pretty anointed. What anointing is, is when God blesses your ability beyond measure. You know, you have, we're all gifted in certain areas, but when the anointing of God comes upon a person, let's say you're gifted at a, at a musician, I wish I was, to be honest with you, wish I could sing, but that's not going to happen on this side of heaven. Uh, you, it has to be in your wheelhouse, right? You have to be called to do it, gifted to do it. Um, let me get this situated. Higher? Good? How's that? All right. Uh, so what I want to do this morning is, um, I'm pretty sure most of you were here last night. We talked about Samson. And uh, there's an incredible book out there I try to read once a year. It's called Surviving the Anointing. And once you're anointed, once you're following God, David Ravenhill wrote it, uh, Leonard Ravenhill's son. And once you are called of God, you're doing God's will, uh, you realize it's not easy. Amen? I know I've got a, a devil's got a 30 out 6 laser right here and right here on me daily. And on many of you, you know, and as you, that spiritual warfare will come upon your life, especially as you're, as you're trying to serve God. So in this part two, it's more about application. Application. Because I'm sure now, okay, Shane, I'm motivated, I'm fired up, but what do I do? What does this look like going forward? So yesterday we built on the foundation, or actually the foundation with repentance and brokenness. Humility, that's the foundation. And having a construction background, something that often amazed me was the higher we went up, the lower you had to go down. The foundation had to support the building. And so digging deeper in our lives through that humility and brokenness, now we can build on the foundation. So application, what is application? It's putting something into motion and maintaining it in the right direction. So when it comes to spiritual application, spiritual disciplines, you hear that time a lot. You know, my quiet time or my Bible reading or my prayer and all these things are so important. The reason why it's so important is because it keeps me moving in the right direction. It keeps you moving in the right direction. That's where words like consistency come up, perseverance, discipline, fortitude, strength, diligence. All those words that were really popular hundreds of years ago, but now... Oh, I want the easy route. I don't want those. And, and, and the world has really kind of turned these biblical principles around and made, it, made us feel bad if we have to be disciplined. And we, we want it microwave Christianity. I want it now. I don't want to work for it. I want to just, God, to, God would you just bless me? And, but these are biblical principles. He is a rewarder of those who seek Him from time to time. <laughs> That didn't even sound good. <laughs> He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And the word, it's, it's, that's why I love doing word studies. You know, you look up the, the Hebrew in the Old Testament, the Greek in the New Testament, and you get a really strong meaning of what a word means. And that word diligence is like a drop of water hitting a rock. Eventually, what happens? It wears that divot. Or I think it was John Hyde, uh, one of the famous Methodist circuit riders. He would wear. He wore. By the time of his death, he wore grooves in the floor of his hardwood floor where his prayer room was for decades. And it's that persistence. It's that diligence. And he. So he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's why you can't trust feelings. I talked about last night and why. No matter. How, you know what? To be honest with you, I didn't feel like preaching this morning. I'm getting a little tired. Anybody not sleep too well? Just me? Okay, good. And so it's, oh, here we go. But I don't care what I feel. Lord, what have you called me to do? So now that I'm up here, it feels great. Now that song was on, the worship came on. And now, God, I just want to preach my heart out and that diligence. And God says, I will reward that diligence. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So to me, it's even when we don't feel like it, that the reward is even greater. Jesus said it's easy to love someone who you love. I mean, it's easy to love your friend and your family. Try loving your neighbor. I mean, that's where the, I mean, try try loving your enemy. And so that's what we talked about. It was a spirit-filled life. Uh, And and what I mean by that, spirit-filled, spirit-led. And um, I want to be careful because sometimes when we talk about the spirit-filled life, it's not about necessarily emotionalism. 
and you know, hearing voices and different things. I believe that the Word of God is the gauge. That's the, the standard, the truth of God's Word. That's where we stay planted. That's where we stay grounded. And as D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, we don't interpret our feelings. We don't interpret Scripture based on feelings. We interpret our feelings based on Scripture. And so to be spirit-led, to be following God, there's spiritual disciplines that must come into play. I don't think it's wise to just say, well, just you know, name it and claim it, or grab it and grab it, or I feel this way and I feel I just feel it. I feel I feel like I should maybe leave my wife. Maybe I shouldn't have been married to her. Do you know I've had people tell me that? Shane, I really feel that I married the wrong person. Well, that you should have determined that before you said I do. And, 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 and leaving their family or doing different things. And I feel God's leading me to break this commitment and really cause this person, uh, not even in marriage, business deals and different things. And these leadings that go against Scripture. So the Scripture is the foundation. That's our gauge. And here's the thing with spiritual disciplines you have to remember. Spiritual disciplines, the application we're going to talk about, they don't make you, it's not about perfect perfection. It's about direction. So the spiritual disciplines, as, as, as much as on this side of heaven I want to obey God, sometimes I fall. I don't know about you. Maybe if you never have, let me know. I'd love to talk to you afterwards and let me know that secret. But the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines make you stronger. It instills fortitude and strength and getting back up and falling forward and continuing the fight. And many people don't understand that spiritual disciplines are one of the greatest things we have to build intimacy with God. The, the, the intimacy with God directly comes directly from it. And so um, I ru ruffled some feathers yet last night. I might ruffle some more. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Well, here's, here's the key. And I'm going to go through them. And I touched a little bit on this last night, but I think it's important to reiterate. When it comes to application, you have to consistently apply meekness. Apply meekness, especially as men. And we don't like that word because we really think of weakness. But weakness and meekness are completely different. Completely different. Anybody have the new fast Dodge cars, 800 horsepower? Very good. Okay. Well, very, I get in trouble with that thing. Very meek. Sitting in the driveway on idle, but go push, push the gas pedal down. All that horsepower comes alive. So it is, like you said, I think, strength under control. So as, a, as men, we are to call to be meek. Have the strength. No one to keep our mouth shut. No one to lead. No one to be loving. Low, no one to be firm. It's that meekness. And that's what Jesus was, was, he embodied meekness. And one of the verses, of course, that we all know, many of us know, I'm, I'm not assuming all of you do, but in James where it says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we have to remember, he's writing to Christians. Sometimes we, what we like to do is, I bet that's good for unbelievers, and then we don't apply it to ourselves. But the Bible is clear that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So when it comes to spiritual disciplines, it is a, it's a time of, of humility and meekness. Lord, I want you to use me. Please humble me. I don't, I don't want to be bombastic. I don't want to be arrogant. I don't want to be prideful. Lord, I need to be shaped by you. And God will give grace to that person. But he will resist the proud. Do you ever know those people that God is actually fighting them? As a believer, you're, God's, it's like I, you're coming and God's like, no, I'm resisting. I'm resisting those who are proud and arrogant and want to do it their way. But I will give grace to the humble. Isaiah 57, God dwells. This is incredible. The God of the universe. We can actually have a relationship with God. We can know God. It doesn't mean life is, 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 is perfect, but it's, it can be very challenging. But Isaiah 57, God dwells with him. You ready? who has a contrite and humble spirit. God says, I will dwell with those who have a contrite and humble spirit. I will revive the spirit of the humble. I will revive the heart of the contrite one. The word revival is to awaken that which is dead. Spiritually speaking, if somebody is dead spiritually, God says, come to me, humble yourself before me, and I will revive your heart. I will, I'm looking for those. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who are humble and broken before him, those who are searching for him. And God says, I will revive that person. Come to me broken. Come to me humble. Come to me as a beggar. 
The Bible is clear. Those who beg, beg. We don't like that word as men. We want you know self-assured, and I'm, I built this company, and I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm, I'm, I make myself, and and we don't like this idea of of needing God. It goes against our our flesh. Pride says, "I got this. Give me what I want, my way or the highway." Anybody relate? That's often why we don't take things to prayer right off the bat because we say, "I got this. Give me what I want. It's my way or the highway." And so many people, you know, they, they'll they'll say, "Yeah, you know, Shane, but I, I know the Bible." Yeah, but so did the Pharisees. What was the difference? They knew the God of the Bible. Their heart, their heart. They, they, they didn't have a relationship like you guys just watched earlier. There was no relationship. It was religion without a relationship. And I've noticed, I don't know if this will apply to anyone here, but on this issue, often the more educated we become in biblical doctrine, the more arrogant we can also become. How is that possible? You ever see any of those websites or YouTube channels? All they do is just pick apart people all day long. And they're very, very astute. They're very knowledgeable. They've got, you know, they can break down systematic theology and pneumatology and eschatology and hermeneutics and homiletics. And they use an inductive and deductive and immediate approach to their sermon preparation. They've got it all dialed in. But they're dead spiritually. They are arrogant. And the power of humility, the power of humility, humility will alter the course of history. And that is clear throughout Scripture. Was Moses prideful? Did God break David, Joshua, Isaiah, Jeremiah? It's amazing. And so when it comes to spiritual disciplines, applying what you're learning this week in it begins, the heart begins with humility. God, teach me, show me. He leads those who are willing to follow. He will raise up the broken and humble people. He will raise them up. Many people, you know, they want positions or they want to be noticed or they want recognition or they want to start a ministry. All of that can be God-given desires. But if we're not careful, it can be about self-exaltation and pride. Look at how humility will help you spiritually speaking. It affects everything from worship to prayer. Relationally, it affects everything from your business to your marriage. Physically, emotionally, humility is very rewarding in these areas. And I won't get into it now. I've done it many times before when I taught on health and fitness. But they, they can directly show how like angry, angry outbursts, anger in the heart of men is a very toxic emotion to the body. With a heart attack and the stress and cortisol and all these things, it's it's very you're high strung and you're intense and and that anger these emo, these things can really affect the body and humility will bring a lot of healing on a lot of different levels. And then the the next step, this is critical. I think this is where many of you guys are at today in this weekend. That's why I'm excited about this. We must apply desperation. Desperate people do desperate things. I think that's why we are in the position that we are in, especially in America and the church. There's not a lot of desperation. America is angry right now, but she's not humble. Oh, she's ticked off, but she's not broken. We don't, we don't want to do desperate people do desperate things. What do they do? They might come at 6 a.m. like you did. They might remove things from their lives that are pulling them down. They might recommit to God in a powerful way. Lord, I am so desperate to hear from you. I am willing to do whatever it takes. God, oh, create in me a clean heart. God, I want to pray that like we did last night. I'm desperate. I need to hear from you. Oh, God, would you rend the heavens, Isaiah said. God, rend the heavens and come down and visit your people. Desperate people, do they not do desperate things? I mean, think about our, how our priorities are whacked out. What about if I offer, I talked to some of you about fasting. It was funny. It's not a very popular topic. I got it. But um, if, you, if you fasted for one week and afterwards I gave you $10,000, how many fasters would we have in this room? Oh, come on. Just oh, you, not, Wow, you guys, $10,000. Lane, you too? Okay. Well, see, what, shouldn't our relationship with God be the priority? See, there's a desperation. There's a motive. 
And that's what many of us are lacking is there's not a desperation and, and to be filled with the Spirit, full of the Spirit, to encounter God, to regain lost ground, and to see irre irreversible change. It will require desperation. And that's why I said last night, it begins and ends with hunger. Or maybe this morning, it begins with hunger. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. And Isaiah cried, Oh God, would you rend the heavens? God, would you rend the heavens and come down and visit your people? And I've been to a lot of men's conferences, and, and uh, I love this stuff, by the way. This is great. Wish I had one at home. But... We always, and I've taught on this before, and we'll, 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 we'll do themes like a battle cry, right? Battle, warfare. But I've learned that a heart cry must come before the battle cry. The heart cry, God, break me, humble me, I'm desperate. And then from the position of brokenness, we, come, we go into battle. But without that, we go into battle arrogant and condescending. And I know so many men, they, they, they rule their house with a rod of iron, but there's no humility. And that will knock you off track. Before we engage the culture, we must engage God. Jesus said, blessed are those who are hungry, they're thirsty. Blessed are those. And again, there's, there's signs of that. There's no appetite when you begin to go into starvation and, and when you, you begin to get real thirsty and there's, there's a lack of interest. They're tired, there's weak, there's apathy, physically speaking. But spiritually speaking, I believe Jesus is saying those who hunger and thirst, there's a, there's a gnawing at your... I've got to encounter God. I have to meet God this weekend. There's a, I'm thirsting for the living God. Oh, my, my soul pants after God like the deer pant, pants after the brook. My soul soul, oh God, would you restore my soul and bring back to me the joy of my salvation. And there's a, there's a longing, God, I'm so hungry, I'm so desperate, I'm so thirsty. God says, blessed is that man. Because there, there's a hunger for me. And here's what happens, when you're hungry for something, you satisfy it. If, there's a, if there is not a hunger for God, I have to wonder what you're consuming spiritually. Because if you're consuming things spiritually speaking, that are not healthy. There's, not going, to, there's going to be a lack of hunger for God. Psalm 119.20 My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all the time. Lord, my soul breaks. I wish I could see your word again elevated, Lord. And I love what Ezekiel said. God told uh, and the angel in Ezekiel, Ezekiel records that the angel, God said, go and set a mark. Go, and, go, go throughout the room, set a mark. On who? On those who sigh and mourn for the abominations that are occurring within my land. Note those, mark those, those are my men. There's a, there's, a, there's a cry, there's a desperation. Look at what is going on in our culture. And the reason I talk about those issues, it should break your heart. These things are thoroughly perverted. They are counter-biblical. They go against God's standard. They're leading millions astray. And there should be a, a, a brokenness, a righteous indignation. Jesus, you know, turning over the, the tables and my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. There's, a, there's something that's sickening about the perversion that's going on when you're desperate for more of God. You're desperate for His Word. Jeremiah would weep over the condition of the people. Isaiah would mourn. Nehemiah would lament. There's always a desperation. David Wilkerson said, when God decides to recover a ruined situation, He finds a praying man and He baptizes him in anguish. Did you get that? When God is going to recover a ruined situation, He will find a praying man and He will baptize him in anguish. Yeah, you can find that clip on YouTube actually. A call to anguish. I encourage anyone, to, I hit repeat on that thing, and I find myself on the altar. Because what is ruined in our nation, what is ruined in our homes and our families, our marriages? And God will literally baptize you in anguish. His heart for what is, His heart that breaks in your heart. Because what, I change, I'm different when I'm in anguish. 
What about if everything, you, you know, your guy got elected, everything's going great, your 401k is great, nothing's going on strategically, gas prices are low. Man, I'm good. But when we see what's really going on, there's an anguish, there's a desperation. We live different. I, know about, I don't know about you, but I live differently. And so many people, I, I heard even this week, you know, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I'll pray about getting into it. I'll come back to it. But there needs to become a heart cry. Oh God, I don't want to be complacent. I don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to be satisfied. Because when I'm complacent, when I'm comfortable, when I'm satisfied, I'm easy attack for the enemy. But when I'm on alert, when you're on alert, that's why Paul said walk circumspectly. Anybody walk out in the desert? I do. I live in the Mojave Desert. There's rattlesnakes. And I walk kind of carefully. I met some black ice this morning. And afterwards I walked a little carefully. And that's what, that's what we do as believers. I don't want to be complacent. I don't want to be comfortable. I don't want to be satisfied. Oh God, give me a hunger. Because when God gives you a hunger, the only way that it can be satisfied is to, to, seek, to keep seeking Him, to keep pursuing Him. The more I seek Him, the more I find Him. The more I find Him, the more I seek Him. The, you seek me with all of your heart. You will find me. I will be your Father. You will be my Son. There will be a passionate desire, a passionate dev devotion. The peace of God will come upon your life. It's a, it's a godly pursuit. But here's the sad reality. You know what? Let me, let me talk about that. Hunger for God is a gift. I thank God every, every week probably for God. Thank you, thank you for being hungry for you. Because you can't serve two masters. What appetite is going to rule and reign in your heart? If there's a hunger for the things in the world, do you think you're going to have a hunger for the things of God? You just contradicted Scripture. You cannot serve two masters for either you love one and hate the other or despise the one and be loyal to the other. You cannot serve both God and this world. So there comes a time. That's why I'm ticking some of you off to get your face on this altar. That's the point. Hello? We need more coaches. You think coaches were nice? The most famous football coach, Vince Lombardi. Yeah. Gentlemen, this is a football. Any man's finest hour is when he lays exhausted on the field of battle victorious. And he would push, he would pressure, because he sees what's in you. He tries to pull out of you what is already inside of you. And sometimes that takes a little right hook. Sometimes it takes a left hook to say, get up, get back up, and fight again. You can do better. This is not acceptable. Won't we to the church to coddle sin? That's why we're in the predicament we're in. The sad reality is the average Christian gets by with just enough to keep them lukewarm but not on fire. We must get to the point where we say, Jesus, you're a priority. I'm going to pursue you even regardless of how I feel. Regardless of how other people think. This man, I had a big shift 20 years ago and I came back to the Lord because you know you're, you're, you love the Lord, you love the Word, but you also like the opinions of your friends. Right? I don't want to post stuff on Facebook. I don't want, I want a secret Christian. These guys are going to tease me, they're going to mock me, they're going to make fun of me. And, we, and, we, and we, we, don't, we don't fully surrender because we're too worried about the opinions of others. And that will, that will sidetrack you every, every opportunity it gets. Because if you follow the opinions of men, God's opinion of you is what really matters. And I remember friends, I lost about eight. Weren't really friends, you come to find out, right? Jesus freak. Holy roller. Oh, he's intense. He's extreme. And it was funny, I would read the book of Acts, early church, I'm like, no, there, this is biblical Christianity. So when you live wholeheartedly for Christ, you look extreme, which is normal Christianity. We've drifted so far off course that we think when people are on fire for God, that's extreme. That's getting a little too carried away. Go tell that to Peter and Paul and the early disciples. Go tell that to 120 people who met in an upper room and waited on the power and presence of God and that God came upon that place and sparked a spiritual revival that we are still experiencing today. Hunger for God is a gift. When you bypass intimacy, you literally push away God's presence and remove the covering of spiritual protection in your life. 
Isn't that true? How do you, how do you, how do you avoid sin and major sin and, 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 lead, and walking away and, and all these things? It's intimacy with Christ. That intimacy, sitting close to the fire. I got to feel the heat. I, it, it was sitting close to the fire, and then as we compromise and we walk away from that flame and we get away, we lose, we leave that intimacy. That's where the enemy comes in. That's where he, he distracts and pulls us away. So now, some more application. Apply spiritual disciplines. So once the heart is right, once there's a humility, God, I want to hear from you, I want you to lead me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop trying to win arguments. Again, I was going back to what you said, the more, the more educated you become in biblical theology, the more arrogant you can become. Knowledge puffs up. And I see it, I'll tell you what, I see it all the time. I can tell somebody who's very arrogant is usually very well versed in doctrine. Think of so where's what's your what are you, postmillennial, premillennial, all millennial? Well, it doesn't matter what I say, you're gonna to want to argue. Calvinism, five points of Calvinism, can you lose your salvation? Can't you lose your salvation? It doesn't matter what I say, you're not teachable, you're not humble, you just want to argue. You want to show me how smart you are. Trust me, I deal with this all the time. And knowledge puffs up, and you have to be very careful of that because God will not use a pride filled, angry man, critical man, critical spirit. And I came back to the Lord in 1999. By 2005, I was a full blown Pharisee. I read all kinds of books. I could quote Spurgeon, I could quote the Puritans, Systematic Theology, Wayne Grudem, Norman Geisler, John MacArthur. Man, I was just. I'll tell them. That guy on TV, yeah. That guy, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the right way. I'll never forget. My mom said, Shane, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. Your family doesn't want to be around you anymore. Because you're too arrogant. And when she's talking about my sister, I think was, was drinking a lot, and I was condemning her, my brother condemning her, and this, and I was, I was a sin sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> Am I just preaching truth? Any of you have went through this season of life? <laughs> now, I love sound doctrine. I love theology. We need it. I believe it's, it's absolutely core, the core foundation. But you can be straight as a gun barrel, theologically, but just as empty. You've got to have both the spirit-filled life of humility and brokenness along with theology. And D. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, if you're thinking about pastoring or preaching, it's called Preachers and, Pre Preachers and Preaching by D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, all preaching is, you ready for this quick sentence? All preaching is, is theology coming through a man who is on fire for God. That's it. And once I realized that, I realized the necessity, the final necessity of humility. And as I humbled myself, see, here's the thing. The, the way to go up in God's kingdom is to go down. The more you humble yourself, God will begin to exalt you. The more you, the more you begin to, Lord, I, whatever you want me to do, I don't want, I don't want a name drop. I don't want to be, you know, go somewhere and, and be put on this platform. I don't care about another book. God, I just want you to use me. And he'll begin to open the doors. Maybe he won't. you got to be satisfied. Oswald Chambers said, God buries his men and women in the midst of poultry things. No monuments are erected to them. Not because they're not important, but because they're in a place where they cannot be seen. Lord, wherever you send me, wherever you send me, and then from that, God says, ah, now I can use that yielded vessel. That person's yielded to my work. Have you ever, if you're fighting against God, it's going to be really hard to do what He wants you to do. I want to do this, Lord. I want to do that. I want to do this. So what, what, and then from that humility and that gentleness and, 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 and that desperation, see how powerful that is? You're humble. Now you can be led of the Spirit. Now you're desperate. There's a hunger. There's a desire. When I see marriages falling apart and men re re rejecting their God-given role as spiritual leaders in their home and the nation crumbling from within, there's a desperation. There's a passion to reach out and want to make a difference. 
And a little bit after that time, I thought I was doing really good. God will keep breaking you, right? I, I read my wife's journal. And she left it open. Now I found, I found out later on purpose. And it said, I've married a man who will not let me, let me pursue my dreams. Controlling. I did not take that too well. But see, these times God's saying, hey, I'm getting your attention. And what she was meant, like you savers can relate, right? My wife wants to start a makeup business. No, we're not going to do that. My kids are, no, we're not going to do that. We need to save money. We need to save money. Save money. That can be controlling. And not let them do things that, you know, they, of course you still want to control the budget. Don't get me wrong. But realizing that this pride and this arrogance, and it's still a process. Still a process. Even I, I told the group six uh, recently, a smaller group t today, I think, about six years ago, I was preaching on uh, the sanctity of marriage and what, how God defines it. And um, I've had, God's had to really just break me over the years. And I, I went, this 18-year-old, uh, this she was a lesbian. And she said, um, you know, you really made me feel bad. And I, the way you're, I'm like, uh, and I just cried with her. And I prayed with her. And that really shaped, okay, Lord, help me. How do I encourage the person but fight the agenda? Lord, please, give because I can fight the agenda. I can go off like there's nobody's business. Because I think it is sexual perversion with, the, with this group of transgender and pole dancing and library story hour with the trans... That just, it's not good. And somebody needs to say, this is not right. We've lost our mind. We've lost our mind. But I need to love the person. We have those who go to our church. I love the person. How can I help you? How can I come alongside of you? And you point them to the cross. You point them to the cross. And you know what else? I, I tell people, God might not instantly take it away. Sometimes you've got to walk with a limp. Sometimes you've got to carry things to your grace. Sometimes you've got to fight temptation. I, the Lord, take that away. Sometimes He doesn't. But the greater testimony often is to get, get to the point at where, the end of your life and say, Christ sustained me. Christ held me. I knew the healer. I knew the shepherd. Although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because Christ is with me. He has lifted me up. And sometimes He doesn't take away everything. Sometimes you have to fight and battle through those things. And sometimes he takes things away. Praise God. As I shared with you last night, I come across people and they say, man, I never, 20 years ago, I never desired to drink ever again. Like, why, why didn't he do that to me? Ice cold one still looks good. What's wrong with me? I must not be saved. Nope, there's still that old shame. Hey, remember those times? Remember that? Remember those days? So we have to apply spiritual disciplines to stay right, to stay on the right path. Philippians 4. Many of you know this. I mentioned it last night. We're going to get into the rubber meets the road. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure. Let me stop right there. This verse will help you more than you realize. Because as, as you think, that's who you are. Negativity, negative Nellies, judgmental Jerry's, critical Cathy's. Karen's, yeah, Karen, yeah. Right, it's, 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 it's who, it's how we think, what we put in here. The mind is powerful. So that's why Paul says his final, finally, brethren, whatever things are true and noble and honest and just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, boy, that goes, I got to get off Twitter. I have to get off Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. You got to be very careful. And I'm not talking about completely just, you know, disconnecting things. But Jesus did say, if your eye caused you to sin, just don't look as much. Of course, you don't physically cut it out because you can sin with the other eye. But extreme measures, extreme measures, the desperate, again, how desperate, how bad do you want it? There's a desperation. I'll never forget I tell the story a lot, but you guys haven't heard it. But it just, and I think it was up in the mountains probably over by Arrowhead at a conference just like this. And afterwards, a guy came up, I'm, <laughs> and he said, this is my last chance for my marriage. My wife gave me an ultimatum. And he's, you know, he's shedding tears, and I was going to pray for him. I said, so what's going on? He goes, I can't give up pornography. 
Okay. He said, it starts with you know, ESPN and the cheerleaders. And then I turned to this. And then I, you know, and I said, okay, well, no brainer. We're going to pray, but you got to make some serious changes. Time to tell your wife you're more valuable. I am going to disconnect from this stuff. I'm going to work on our marriage. I'll never forget. He said, bro, I can't do that. I'm a sports fanatic. <laughs> Really? That's why A.W. Tozer said, don't come up here and cry about it. Go home and live it out. Are you kidding me? I just want to slap him, but you can't do that as a guest speaker. <laughs> almost, almost went Victor Marks on him. Right? I was on his podcast last week. We, he did an interview, and we're going to hopefully air it on his channel in the next week or two. You guys got to listen to it. But... Um, it just, I, like, I was, I'm usually not stunned or, you know, short on words, but I was just, what did I just hear? <laughs> but isn't that true of many men? I don't want to do what it takes. I'm not desperate enough. I want to coddle Delilah. I want to play with her a little bit. Desperate people do desperate things. I know people that, hey, I'm getting rid of my iPhone for a season. Give me a flip phone. I'm going to do this. And see, it's not what we don't like in the Bible we call legalism. Leonard Ravenhill said that, especially on the topic of fasting. Oh, that's legalistic. Oh, that means you don't like it. Oh, Shane, that's too extreme. You're getting legalistic. Oh, that just means you're convicted. Big difference. Legalism is no good at all. It's following rules. I don't do this, and I don't do this, and I don't do this. But what does wisdom say? Biblical principles. I choose not to do these things because it's drawing me away from God. It's drawing me away from my spouse. It's making me into an angry man who can't be a good father to my kids. So I'm making these decisions because it'll help me grow spiritually. That's the big difference. Legalism is following rules and trying to gain God's favor. And so Paul said, meditate on these things. This is key. Here, Listen to this. And the peace of God will be with you. Could it be that peace is, has a lot to do with what we're meditating on? What we're focusing on? Spend a couple hours in the book of Psalms and you tell me you aren't encouraged. You start to realize that God is my defender. God is my shield. Who can stop God Almighty? What army can defeat Him? What governor can overthrow Him? The angel armies of heaven. God sits high and lofty on His throne. Nothing can defeat Him. Not China, not Russia, not the whole world combined. God will just vaporize them. That's the God we serve. He'll just send an angel. Ask the Assyrian Sennacherib, who came against Hezekiah. 185,000 of the toughest, toughest guys on the planet. Hezekiah, I believe, went to prayer and fasting and worship. And the death angel slew 185,000 Assyrians at night. That's the God we serve. And see, if you start reminding yourself of that, fear has no place when you realize that God is on the throne. So this, my friends, is where the battle is won or lost. Like I said last night, have you been hit by a literal fiery dart? Where did they come then from? In our thought life. So let's break these down for a minute. Oh, by the way, Melinda Gates, uh, Bill Gates' wife, <laughs> doesn't let her kids have smartphones and they only use the computer in the kitchen when they're under 14. In Silicon Valley, the Waldorf School of the Peninsula bans all technical devices. Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook wants his kids to read instead of going, Messenger, come on, guys. <laughs> So let me talk about this for a minute. Focus, this is key. Focus on things that are true. True. See, we have something going on right now. Truth decay. The reason there's so much, everyone's kind of vague. Like, you know, did Paul really mean that? I mean, the Old Testament is so passe. We don't really need that anymore. And everything, everything's vague. They want to have a conversation. But the truth is relevant. The truth does not change. You don't change truth. Truth changes you. Times change. Truth does not. The absolute truth of God's Word. And I think it's near here somewhere. Maybe over by Big Bear. There was a turning point in Billy Graham's life. 
when he was younger. Anybody heard, I knew some of you have, of the name Chuck Templeton? One guy, anybody else, Chuck Templeton? He was actually a more gifted preacher than Billy Graham. Believe it or not. And what happened? He started to drift into liberalism. He went to academia. They began to question the inerrancy of Scripture. I think Lee Strobel, you can find the intertube on YouTube, the interview on YouTube, interviewed him before his death. And he began to tear up because he misses Christ. He gave up on the truth of God's Word. And the Billy was at a turning point. He was, he was struggling. He was having a real... And when your mind goes there, trust me, I've been there. When I read Martin Luther's debate of Erasmus and Augustine with, with Plagian and, and the bondage of the will, and, and, you, and you start to really, you know, your mind, you just let it go places like, you start to doubt and start, it, it'll take you down a very dark road. And that's why you got to get back on track with God's Word. So Billy Graham put his Bible on a tree stump up in the mountains from here, out there. And he said, God, I take this as your Word, your final authority, and a story. I'm not going to let my mind go there again. And now we hear from Billy Graham. The filling of the Holy Spirit, the concrete, absolute truth of God's Word penetrated his heart. So he says here, whatever things are true, meditate on these things. Well, there goes MBNC and CNN and all those news outlets, right? I mean, be a little informed, but be very careful. The truth is so powerful. And that's why I get passionate about this, because do you know the whole role of the prophetic? Isaiah... Jeremiah, most of them, Ezekiel and Daniel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and you've got Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, Zachary. What was God said? I would raise up my messengers to draw my people back. Is not my word like a fire? Is not my word like a hammer? Is not like my word like a sword that pierces even to the, the, the division of soul and spirit? The word, let the word of God loose. Spurgeon said the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just open the cage and let the lion out. We need to get back to the truth of God's word. Let that truth penetrate our heart and walk in the boldness and the fullness of God's spirit. The truth will set you free. The absolute truth of God's word. Why do you think they are questioning truth now? That's a big battleground, isn't it? You fundamentalist. It's a bad word now, right? It's actually a really good word. It came from 1904, 1905. R.A. Torrey wrote the fundamentals of the faith. And that's where it came from. The virgin birth, the inerrancy of Scripture, the resurrection, the deity of Christ, the essentials of the gospel. Listen, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's not changing. You don't change truth. Truth changes you. So no, we can't compromise. We can't capitulate. We can't say, okay, you can have the cross, but give us the, the atonement. You can have this, and, and let's all just get along and sing Kumbaya and ecumenical movements. And You can't. I'll, I'll go to lunch with Mormons and, and Jehovah Witnesses and things, but, but to worship the one true and living God. There's a truth that is, is essential. And then he said, meditate on what is noble and what is honest. What does that mean? What inspires awe for God? Go through Netflix and see if what fits. Actually, don't. Or voodoo, or what are those popular things, you know, and we just go through and are these things noble? Are they honest? Does, does this inspire an awe for God, or does it draw me away from God? The mind, whatever things are just, judged by God's standard, whatever things are pure, the fight for fight, there's a fight for your for your for your spirit, folks. Carnality versus caving into it. What is pure? And isn't purity a beautiful word? Purity. It used to mean something a long time ago. It was something special when young adults would save themselves. Purity and an innocence. And that's why I get fired up. They're having porno pornographic books in, in libraries of small children. These story hours of life. This is truth, folks. This is not fake news. What's that thing that just got Balencia, that just got canceled? Balencia or something that the child porn just about on, on Instagram and all these people, Kardashians are following, now they're, they're rejecting it and we see what's coming out. It's darkness, it's perversion. 
And the, the, the purity, the purity, is God not holy and pure and righteousness? There's something special about purity. He says, finally, folks, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, does it elevate God's glory? Is it, is it majestic? Whatever things are of a good report, if it's good, is it good news? Good report. I, I wish there would be a news channel that would just put on good news. Here's what's happening across the United States that is good. Not buildings burning, Twitter this, Facebook that, Russia, China, Ukraine. Always, always dread and fear and trepidation. But God's word says make sure you focus your mind on things that are good. And then make sure it says focus on things that are virtuous, integrity, men of integrity. So see guys, this I could fix half of your problems right here. Change what you meditate on. Are you consuming God's word or are you consuming junk that is just mindless and stupid? I tell my kids a lot, what do you watch? That's stupid on YouTube. You're going to watch a guy flip a bottle? Try to stick it up there for a half hour? Or do these, I mean, I do perfect. They watch, they, they, I guess they're okay. But there's other stuff where it's just, just, plain just, just weird. It's why, why, why? And it's just, our mind becomes mush. And it takes discipline to reject some of these things because we all know where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's a will, there's a way, but excuses hide the way. Making excuses in these areas and the flesh will fight you every step of the way. So here's some things you can do. Ways to meditate. Ways to put God first. Way to apply God's Word. You have to, at this point in history, you have to schedule it. Everything else is on the calendar. When are you going to put God on the calendar? That's the priority. That's the foundation. It has to be scheduled. Most people say, well, you know what? Later today, when I get some time, that's when I'll do it. And how does that go? Not too good, usually. Some of you are night people. That's fine. I'm a morning guy. And it has to, I have to get that time in with God. I have to get that time where I'm broken and humble before Him and, and building on that foundation. So you have to schedule in no matter where it fits in your day. When I was in construction, digging ditches, I was at the water district, and I'd have to dig up old water meters and put new ones in, hundreds and hundreds, and I had a Walkman, remember those, I'm dating myself, but listen to tapes and get built up and strengthened, or some of you, I remember when I was uh, with another construction company, and, and all they wanted me to do, I thought it was the best job in the world until I did it. All I did all day long was hold the sign. Here comes a car. Okay, stop. Got on the radio. Okay, let that car through. Stop. This is cool for about 30 minutes. <laughs> and my, it's like, this is sucks. I have to do it for six weeks. $30 an hour wasn't bad back then. Just holding the stop sign. I can see cars a mile. There's nobody coming. What am I supposed to do? You can't move. You can't go to the bathroom. You have to call someone in. And, and, but what I finally did after about three days is I made hundreds, I wrote down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses on a three by five card. And so I've got the sign in this hand, and I'm just flipping through these verses all day long. Don't tell the boss that, probably, you know, but because I could see the cars and it wasn't anything, just flipping those. So what, what will work in your life? What about you commuters? Can you imagine how much, you can get through the whole Bible in like five months, three months, the whole Bible, just hearing God's word. And I mentioned last night when I was on a backhoe, I just had the radio on 3,000 hours of teachings. You guys, where there's a will, there's a way. Oh, I'm just a busy executive. Yeah, that means you can have even find more time somewhere, somehow, schedule God. Tell the secretary, I've got an appointment. Who's it with? It's just an appointment. And go spend time with God. We can, where there's a will, there's a way. We can, if it's a priority, we will make time for it. Whatever your favorite sport is, you make time. Golf, boxing, watching sports, you make time. And if you, you get, you, you don't, God can't be on the back burner. He's got to be on the front burner in our lives. And then here's a big key. Are, are you guys ready for this one? James 1.22, be doers of the word. And not just hearers only. Because what happens, and it actually goes on to say, you live in deception. So when I hear God's word and I don't do it, I actually live in deception. And I've got, there's a lot of men, they love to quote, to quote Bible verses to their spouse. 
Woman, you better submit to me. <laughs> I just met with a guy a couple months ago. Now I go, dude, you don't. If you have to say that, if you have to say that, there's a deeper problem going on. You don't walk around. The Bible says this. The Bible says this. You submit to me. What, what is that? That man needs to be slapped too, maybe, right? But we, but, but, but we have to be doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving ourselves. And actually the verse, you have to remind men sometimes about submission. Actually before that it says you're submitting to Christ. Hello? I've never met a woman yet who doesn't want to follow a man who's following Christ. There might be a few out there, so don't come out afterwards but, and tell me. Talk highly of your spouse. But there, there are a few out there. Okay, maybe I'll take that one back. But most women want to follow men who follow in Christ. And if I have to quote scripture at them, I've already lost the battle. Your life should resemble the scripture. Now, if you're teaching and you know devotionals, um, you know that's a different thing. And I want to encourage you guys. Devotion. Anybody try to have devotional with kids and your wife? It's hard. The enemy does not like it. All hell breaks loose. My four-year-old doesn't want to listen. My nine-year-old's distracted. My son thinks he knows it all. They don't want to, I've got a couple daughters, they want to listen, but then it's just so challenging because we're trying to get the Word of God into them. Obey the Word of God. Do not just be hearers only. Psalm 107, those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, they are bound in afflictions and iron because they rebelled against the Word of God and they despised the counsel of the Most High. Often depression and hardship, often, not always, are caused by sin and rebellion. Often. 1 Samuel 15, the Lord delights. He delights in burnt offerings. Oh, I'm sorry, it says the Lord does not delight in burnt offerings and, and sacrifices as much as obeying the voice of God. To obey is better than sacrifice. 1 John, Jesus said, those who love Jesus keep His commandments. And so once we get that established, the final point here, obviously, is prayer, fasting, and worship. It, become, it needs to become a lifestyle of prayer, fasting, and worship. And I need, to, I need to just tell you guys something. I had to repent this morning, early this morning. Because about four days ago, I removed the section I'm going to read to you. I removed it and said, no, 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 I don't want to go there. You know, we're going to eat lunch, we're going to have breakfast, which is all good. Do it. Enjoy it. But there comes a point in your life where you need to deny the flesh. And this, this pamphlet is written, it's an old pamphlet, Power with God. Power with God by somebody named Winky Prattney. He said, Esau had not learned physical control. When bodily appetites rule reason, when there is a lack of self-control, man becomes earthly and sensual, effectively boosting physical drive to the point where his spiritual rule is impossible. He goes on to say, little is said about fasting today, even though there are 55 mentions, references in the Bible. All men greatly used by God in Scripture held strict control of their appetites. And he goes on to say a lot of other things that are pretty convicting. But he said, the appetite for food is perhaps more frequently than any other the cause for backsliding and powerlessness. Now you might say, I don't know about that. But I would encourage you to really look at Scripture. Look at what Scripture... To Ezra fasted for protection. Nehemiah fasted. Why should I not be sad when the place of my father's tombs lies in waste? Moses fasted. David fasted. Esther called to fast. Joel said, when things are dire in our nation and things are falling apart, call a sacred assembly. Call a sacred assembly. Call a fast and come into the house of my God and cry out to God. Paul said, I was in much fastings and, and, and I was desperate to hear from God. Jesus spent some time on the backside of a the desert. There's something powerful when men begin to deny their, their physical appetite. Appetites. The hunger for God is greater. That's what this is about. I know it's not popular, but it sure is powerful. I would not be up here today. I would not be to the extent God has, has, has placed me in certain places without the discipline of fasting. It doesn't mean you don't walk around and eat. I'm going to enjoy some tri-tip. Okay? But sometimes you've got to tell the flesh, no, shut your mouth. I'm in control. You're not. And I want, to be, I want that fullness of the Spirit and of course, you, you have to marry fasting with prayer. I don't know, somebody said, who was that in the Bible? This kind cometh not out except by... 
Could it be? Could it be? I read the early church fathers on this. I've read a lot of theologians on it. You know, you students of Scripture know that some, whether it's it's the received text, the majority text, where we got different translations from. Some Bibles don't have that text, but others do. Uh, but I think it's very powerful when Jesus said this kind. Is it could it, could it be that there are some strongholds, some strongholds that do not come out of a person until there's a season of prayer and fasting? It's like that sledgehammer break. I remember I was breaking concrete one day with a sledgehammer hammer and this is this is taking forever and, and my dad said hold on son here comes the backhoe with the breaking arm blah, 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 blah. and that we're done in 20 minutes but see sometimes something bigger and stronger has to come in and fight that kingdom that, that, that spiritual stronghold over your life this kind cometh not out except by prayer and fasting and although you won't do it perfectly I've never done it perfectly to my knowledge there's a desire there's a desperation there's a breaking down one brick at a time as you're consecrating yourself to the Lord this is all biblical. Look at the early church fathers. What Jerome taught on fasting. Ignatius, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr. You, could, you, you couldn't even fast. You, they wanted you to fast before you were being baptized. John Wesley wouldn't even ordain men in the ministry until they fasted on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. Now that might be legalistic. I don't know. But there's, see, you want men who have their, control, their bodily appetites under control. Unless I'm preaching... To an empty crowd here, we know that often the flesh will dominate if we don't bring it into submission. If we don't MMA fight it. And that's what this is about. And I told you last night, you think I'm joking, I'm not. My flesh, as soon as it wakes up, wants Krispy Kreme. And Starbucks. And then pizza. Then porn. Then attitude, then pride, then arrogance, then laziness, then a nap, then go to bed early, then be a jerk, then more stuff that's not good. See, the flesh is constantly... Po- Can I get a witness? Is it just me? Am I being too transparent up here? Because you know. You know. And so that's a fasting that says, shut your mouth. You shut your mouth. I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. You need to, you need to learn obedience. And it comes with the best area is this area that hits us the hardest. Why are these things that are so important so hard? Why is prayer and fasting so hard? I mean, I can drive home and put on Christian worship on for an hour, no problem at all. But try to pray and fast for an hour? And just get our hearts right before God? Ian Bounds said, when faith ceases to pray, it ceases to live. He went on to say, without prayer, the church becomes a graveyard, not an embattled army. Praise and prayer are stifled and worship is dead. And many of us have become too busy to pray, too preoccupied to worship, and too important to seek God. Guys, we've got to get back to a life of prayer. Prayer is where the battle lines are drawn. James 5, 16, the effectual, fervent of a righteous man. That that is rich. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails month. It means it means it's going to accomplish something. What is effectual? Effective. It's targeted. Satan, you will not have my son. Satan, you will not have my daughter. I come against him. Did you know your prayers can outlive you? I know my prayers can outlive me. I don't know about you, but I serve a God who can reach into the future when I'm long gone, and he can pull that prodigal son or daughter home. Folks, what's it going to take? Do you really believe in the power of prayer that you need to get on? On your face and begin to draw your kids back to you and pray over your household pray over your marriage be specific God take this away from me be effective and then the fervent prayer that fervency that desire that's calling down heaven oh if I could just find if my people are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray I will heal their land there's a fervency and I'm effective I'm targeted but then I have to be righteous now of course Theologically speaking, the, the, the righteousness of Christ, the atonement, the, these big theological terms, the imputed righteousness of Christ, we are right standing before God because of what Christ did. But there's also something where the Bible talks about a believer that, is, that there's, a, there's a filling of the Holy Spirit. They're, they're, they have a right relationship with God. They're on fire for God. And, and, and God will take that effective, fervent prayer from a person filled with the Spirit of God, and that will accomplish things. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at what God does with humility. 
and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. When was the last time you laid hands on your children and you prayed for them? You prayed for your spouse. When was the last time? Do we really, do we really believe in the power of prayer? Folks, we're not in Kansas anymore. In case you're not aware, the stench of the nostrils of our sin has reached God. The stench, the stench of our sin has reached the nostrils of God. Where are the men of prayer? That's what I love reading about old books. Men of prayer. It was incredible. When, when, when Luther was pr pr prayed, the church was ignited. When John Knox prayed, all of Scotland came to their knees. When Whitfield prayed, he shook a nation. When Wesley prayed, America fell to her knees. When Spurgeon prayed, Spurgeon had a hundred people underneath him praying during his sermons. The power of prayer. Guys, we got to get back to a praying church that isn't worried about time and looking at the clock and our schedules. We've got to become men of prayer. God, the God, prayer will move the hand of God. Is not spiritual warfare prayer? The weapons we have are not carnal. The pulling down of strongholds is not going to come from me yelling at the devil. This is how I fight my battle. I don't know about you, but I'm on my face, on my knees before God saying, God, please, you've got to do something. You've got to intervene. Please, God, make a difference. I'm not giving up on California. Why? Because I'm looking up. I'm looking up to the cross. You might be going to hell in a handbasket, but I'm taking as many people with us as we can. I put this out on a sermon, I think a year ago, and I just, it's so relevant. The power of prayer. Actually, you could say about all spiritual disciplines, but mainly prayer. Prayer is a great sin killer. It is a fear quencher. It is a power bringer. It is a victory giver. It is a holiness promoter. It is a lust eliminator. Amen? It is an obstacle remover. It's a demon slayer. It's a wisdom giver. It's a peace promoter. It's a depression lifter. It's an anxiety demolisher. It's an anger suppressor. It's a weakness remover. It's a strength booster. And it's a revival stimulator because who can stop God Almighty? What demon can beat him? What army can defeat him? What power can overcome Christ? What agenda can stop him? What ruler can control him? What king can dethrone him? What law can hinder him? What plan can thwart him? And what disaster can discourage God? Yeah. Everything I just said, is it not true? Absolute truth. When men and women pray, it moves the hand of God. We talk a lot about revival, and I love revival. Maybe, maybe it's a weird word to some of you, but it's a biblical word. It just means spiritual resuscitation. Yeah. And if we don't need that today, then I, I'm, I'm retiring. I'll go do something else. The church is dead. People are bored. Men are not on fire for God. Right. I mean, that just amazed me. I hope I can say this. But this email goes out to a, over a thousand people to come to an event, and how many show up? How many respond? There's no hunger. There's no desire. If you were to put in this email, hey, five hundred dollar Costco cards for the first hundred. <laughs> you could? Did you know you could have filled up this room and had chairs out there? See, there's a desperation for the wrong things. When men get on fire for God, that's where you're going to see lives being radically changed. And so my challenge to you is this. The flame in the upper room still burns today. Did you know that? The flame in the upper room still burns today. I'll never forget when I came back to the Lord. And just fill me with this fire. The Word of God comes alive. And I start to read in the book of Acts and Paul. And I'm like, that, me too. Me too. That's what's happening. Me too. See, the same thing they experienced. They're filled with the presence of God. They came out in the power of God. And Peter, who once denied him, now he's talking to a group. And he says, you stiff-necked people. You put Christ on the cross. You better repent. Where did that come from? The endowment of the Spirit, the spiritual power. And that flame continues to go down throughout history. And those who grab hold of the presence of God are set on fire for God. So what a travesty it would be at the end of our journey to find that pride, laziness, and compromise robbed us of the blessings and anointing of God. So we're going to do something a little bit different right now. Um, 
I think they're going to work on getting the lights down. We're going to put the worship back on. That last song was phenomenal. Um, maybe keep it down a little bit. But we're going to have the, some of the leadership team up here. And we would love to pray with you right up front. We would love to pray with you. And there's something special that happens when you say, you know what, I need help. I need help. Did you know as a pastor, sometimes I go to my prayer team and I say, would you pray for me? I need help. I need help. And we've got to stop sitting in our comfortable seats thinking, I got this. Sometimes we need help. And we're going to have the, the six guys or so are going to be up here. I'll be up here as well. I'll be over here in this corner by this door. We would love to pray for you. This is a time where you see the hand of God move. I could give you, I, we could be here for a couple hours of the testimonies. Of the testimonies, I've got, we have a prayer, a prayer room that is full after every one of our services. The, there's demonic deliverance. There's, there's people being set free. There's families being restored. Marriages, we've seen so many people, they're going to divorce and now they're at the altar worshiping. We believe in the power of prayer because I love preaching and I want people to hear. It's good to sing worship songs. But when God, the Spirit of God moves is when men begin to pray and ask God, where two or three are gathered in my presence, there I am in the midst of them. You have not because you ask not. Ask not. Ask not.